Hey, hey everyone, it's your Peacekeeper, and I want to bring a video to you that I personally thought would be an interesting subject to discuss. Now, I'm a little bit of an engineering-minded person, and I, I always like to know, you know, how things work, and I think that's part of the reason why I really enjoy, you know, warships in general, like just the engineering feats that went into their construction. And in this one, I want to talk about ship fire control, because I think that's something that we all take for granted in game. And obviously, because basically we as the humans take over control over what would be some pretty complex mechanical computers on board ships. And I, I just I think they're fascinating. So what I want to talk about here is how a ship gets from acquiring a target to engaging them with their guns. Let's focus on battleship gunnery, as these ships were not only the kings of naval artillery, but it's far easier to explain because these ships were a little less limited in their displacement, and thus we didn't have super complex and lightweight setups. We can just talk straight away about the basics of what it took to actually engage another ship. Now, there are ways to accomplish the same thing with, you know, complex math, but we're not going to go over any of that because the math, quite frankly, is boring. It's a bunch of geometry, and there's really no reason to cover it. I, I just want to go over the basics. What we will cover, though, is basically the fire control systems that span this game's time frame. So basically we're looking at some pre-World War I stuff, World War I, and World War II. Uh, Post-World War II, you know, big changes in fire control didn't really happen until long after World War II in the 1980s. So we're not going to worry too much about that. We're just going to dive right on into that history of the pre-World War I era fire control. Now, before World War I, fire control was accomplished through what is essentially called local control. Or in other words, each turret had control over itself and had its own plotting room, had its own fire control tables, and basically aimed its own guns. Any aircraft guns at the time were hand-aimed, either using cranks or they were like hand cranks, or were, you know, physically moved by people on the mounts, kind of like what we would see with these 20 millimeter Orlikan mounts down here. Uh, basically, they would move the whole mount with their body. You know, the the Bofors and before that, uh, the what the U.S. used, the 1.1 in Chicago pianos, those were all hand cranked operated units and or they were very limited hydraulic control. Any corrections in fire control, though, had to be visually observed, and corrections had to be made from each individual turret. This meant that each turret had to observe their own fall of shot using, like, a die bag setup where it would change the color of the splashes downrange. And, as you can probably imagine, this added a lot of weight to a ship, and there was a lot of difficulty in spotting a shell's fall at longer ranges, and how they would do this, and maybe we go to uh, Aktiobraskaya Revolutsia here, if we go oh, wrong way. Uh, I can show you a little bit better here, being that this ship still retained them, exactly what, uh, you know, they used for sighting. You can see these little divots here on the top, and then on the back you can see these here. Now, on the original ones, uh, basically you had these sighting hoods that, had periscopes that could be used. One was used for each barrel mount, and then you had some other uh, um, other viewers to actually spot the shot, fall of shot. Now, in the back here was your primary range finder, and this is still a feature that's on a lot of the battleships, you know, all the way up through World War II, and um, that right there was how basically these guns would be ranged correctly because they didn't have a primary range finder. All right, let's go back to Alabama here. And with that, you know, you had some problems. And leave it to the British in 1912. So we're getting close to the, you know, World War I here. They developed the first fire control director based system. And... Uh, it was based upon this principle that uh, 
we're we're gonna instead of having each turret controlled locally, we're gonna utilize one central room with a fire control director set up that basically took away a lot of that local control, though the contr issues with local control. So there are a couple of primary advantages to having a fire director based setup. The primary advantage is that the primary rangefinder could be placed high up on the ship and give information to a centralized fire control room where they could send commands to the guns where they would be trained and fired from the turrets upon command. Now, on board, you know, the Alabama and other U.S. battleships and then a lot of destroyers and cruisers as well, your tallest portion of the ship is going to be, your tallest portion of the superstructure is going to contain the primary rangefinder on it. Now we can see that here on the Alabama, although the cameras aren't going to let me show it to you very well. But you can see here on top we have ourselves the primary rangefinder is mounted up here. And then on top of it is a fire control radar, which we'll get to talking about in a little bit. But this right here was the primary fire control tower. And out back, we had the secondary fire control tower. And what this allowed you to do is, it, one, it gave you a lot better view of the battlefield. Because you were, instead of being at gun level and being subject to having to see through the smoke of other guns firing or through fires that are on deck, you are now above all of that. And so long as the winds weren't blowing right into it, you could see better. Plus, you can see further over the horizon when you're sitting higher up on a ship. And so the other big thing that this did was is it basically took away all of the localized control issues with, you know, combat fatigue impacting how a... Well, it minimized. It didn't remove it entirely. It minimized how the, the combat fatigue causing people to make mistakes. So minimizing that helped a lot in reducing, you know, miscalculations in range or heading or speed of the ship that they were shooting at. Now, how they accomplished this was this centralized fire control setup. Basically, what happened would be that they would take in the information and to get the guns to the point where they wanted to, they had what was called a pointer follower system or follow the pointer system. When all of the fire control solution had been calculated, and they would send this information to the turrets on what was essentially a dial. And there was a person that was in charge of training and ele or elevating uh, the guns and they would move the turret in their respective direction until the point their pointer matched up with the pointer from fire control. While local control was still utilized on smaller vessels, centralized fire control began to take over on the dreadnoughts being built, and specifically HMS Dreadnought would be the first of the uh, Royal Navy battleships to take control over, you know, and have a true fire control center on board a battleship. The other major invention during this time frame was the advent of the electrical mechanical fire control computer. This automated calculations to the point where the only inputs needed to be put into a computer would basically automatically move the pointers based upon the input data. The advent of the fire control computer comes from Admiral, well, it would be later Admiral Sir Frederick Charles Dreyer and was invented actually before World War I. It was called the dryer table and allowed for very advanced fire control for the time frame. Its ability to track change in range, angle on bow, speed, pitch, and roll, and output a fire control solution was unprecedented for the time. This level of automation would take quite a while for it to be, um, you know, another advance similar to it to be taken and to be created, basically. And it wouldn't be until the U.S., in the mid 1930s came out with their fire control, their advanced fire control computer. And we'll talk about this in just a little bit, but in the U S anyway, the implementation of its first fire control computer, which was called a range keeper in the United States was in 1916 on board the USS Texas. The continued evolution of these computers controlling a pointer system explo exposed a serious flaw in the fire control solution. And that was human fatigue. And we already talked about how local control going to fire control reduced, you know, centralized fire control reduced the fatigue issue, at least 
somewhat reduce the fatigue issue where you had issues in inputs. Well, at this time, all of these, all this information was input manually into these computers. There wasn't any level of automation there. Well, that would change going into World War II with the, uh, the, in the United States with the Ford Instruments Mark I computer, which was made in the 1930s. And it combined remote power control of the turrets and a centralized fire control computer that was able to take in basically all of the inputs that you could possibly want and turn it into a fire control solution while also taking control of the turrets completely automatically. Now, the Alabama in-game launched with the original Mark I computer, and if I remember correctly, all of these computers were actually upgraded to the Mark I-A when the Mark I-A was developed. Now, the Mark I computer was unique in the fact that it was small enough and accurate enough, and the remote power control worked well enough that you could control any of the turrets for both the primary and secondary batteries from main fire control, but just by flipping a switch, a series of switches to control which turrets you actually wanted. And it also allowed for each turret, which also had their own computer in them, to control other turrets. So this created a massive increase in the survivability of your fire control setup. Now you can see here on, on uh, Alabama, we've still got our fire, our primary range, or sorry, our, our local control range finders, which were useful. Let's say we took a shell and it took out main fire control down here in the center of the ship underneath the armored belt and underneath the armored deck. And if it took that out somehow, they could take over fire control from one of the three turrets on board the ship, and that turret could fire the other turrets from that turret. So if I was in the number one turret, we lost fire control, and number one turret was somehow the one that defaulted to taking over, the number one turret could fire the number two and number three turret. That was a huge advantage for the time, but the real advantage of the Ford Mark 1A was when radar began using, you know, became became a primary input into these computers. The advent of the radar revolution in the detection and rough ranging aspects of fire control allowed for us to not only detect ships, but when the resolution started stepping up, we were able to accurately predict the range of targets as well as observe the fall of the shot onto the target. And combining all of that together with a system that automatically took in all these inputs and automatically turned all of the guns that were selected in the fire control room or in a turret, if you were in lo uh, local control that was taking over other turrets, just allowed for a huge degree of automation. And this was by far the single largest advantage that any nation had during World War II when it came to fire control. It literally eliminated the vast majority of human error. Now, the Ford Mark 1A also had the ability to accurately predict where a ship would be when the rounds impacted in the ocean and land. In fact, the basics of this computer would be in the Mark 1A, and in the 1980s, during the Iowa's refits, the U.S. Navy tested the Mark 1A and determined that there was absolutely no advantage in accuracy from changing the electrical mechanical computer to what we would think of as a, a true electronic computer, like, you know, like I'm talking to you on. There was no advantage there. The, in fact, the only thing they actually added was a Doppler radar to the top of each turret to measure the shell velocity as it went out for accurate follow-up shots. But the Ford Mark I was not perfect. One of the biggest problems with the Mark I was that it could not calculate elevation of a target for a non-stationary target that, you know, like change in elevation, it could figure out and you could put in the elevation of the target so long as it was stationary. But if that target was changing its altitude or its elevation, there was no way to compensate for that in the Ford Mark I. And this meant that the Ford Mark I had limited use when firing at aircraft. This was a, there was a modification made in the late 1930s 
to allow the Mark I to accept a changing elevation, and that became what was known as the Ford Mark I-A fire control computer, and it became the mainstay of U.S. fire control well into the 1960s. And like I said, in the 1980s during the refits, the Iowas retained their use. So I guess technically you could say all the way up until the 2000s when the Iowas are finally formally struck from the Navy Register, the Ford Mark I-A computer, invented in the 1936, the, the mid-1930s, was still in use. Just to goes to show how accurate these things were. And combining that with, with radar on board your, your fire control setup to get accurate ranges basically meant all you had to do was point your fire control director for your main battery at the target, hit the input switch, and it would automatically input all this, automatically turn all the turrets that fire main fire control wanted, and main fire control could fire those guns remotely without ever having anyone inside the turret do anything aside from load the guns. Huge advantage. Absolutely huge advantage. So how does one detect a target and engage it? And this is literally going to be the... I want. I see something, I want to shoot it. So how do we go from detection all the way to shooting? Well, the first step depends on the time frame in which we are discussing. But ultimately, the steps are basically the same. It's just a change in how we, we do step number one. Well, the first step is obviously detection. Now, at the advent of radar in the late 1930s, at least the proliferation of radar in the late 1930s, if your surface search radar didn't pick them up, it had to be visually. So you usually had some guy standing on top of up here, you know, with binoculars. He would be able to tell the... Um, you know, main fire control director, roughly where they were at. That's assuming the radar didn't pick them up first. And of course, the U.S. relied extensively on radar. And the U.S. fast battleships, you know, their surface search radar, the SG radar, which on this ship is mounted back here. It's this little tiny one right here. Um, that radar had an effective range of about 35,000 yards for battleship sized targets. That was about the average range. There are many instances in which, you know, individual ships exceeded this capability with that radar, but overwhelmingly 35,000 yards was about as far as you could search with this particular radar setup with accuracy. The second step involves attempting to achieve visual identification of the target. This can be done through either the primary optical rangefinder, which again is this, these wings here on this uh, upper portion, or through the use of a spotter aircraft. Once a target has been confirmed to be an enemy, the range must be found. And on board the Iowas and the South Dakotas and the uh, North Carolinas, this was achieved through the use of the, the primary fire control radar, which was called the Mark 13 fire control radar, which that little drum up there controlled both had both the emitter and receiver for uh, the, the radar unit. And if that was not working and for backup to the radar, they also used the optical setup. Now this optical setup basically required you to take two pictures of a ship and line them up so that they were one on top of the other perfect, you know, like, Per take two pictures and merge them into one picture. When you did this, it was able to calculate the angle that was required to bring those two pictures together, and this would give you the range through trigonometry. And again, math, we don't need to go into that. Now, the Mark 13 fire control radar, and this is going to probably surprise some people, had an accuracy at 30,000 yards of plus or minus 30 yards of the target's actual range. And that was at 30,000 yards. Now, all the way out to the max range of, of the 16-inch 45 and 16-inch 50 caliber guns, we only saw an increase of about 15 yards to 45 yards. So that's pretty accurate for radar of the day. And actually, it revolutionized things. I mean, we, we no longer had to rely upon the you know an operator to line up two pictures aside from to confirm that the radar range was accurate. And in a lot of ways, optical range finding was flawed because it depended upon the operator to recognize certain aspects of a ship uh, 
and be able to line them up correctly, precisely. And at longer ranges, that error got larger and larger. Once you have the range set on this, it, those inputs are automatically going to be fed into the power mounts on board the ship that are selected. So if, if, if we're shooting at a ship, it's going to automatically feed that information into the computer, and the computer is automatically going to point the main turrets of the gun. Uh, sorry, the, of the ship. And for the Mark 1A, it could be switched to a ser you know, basically control just about any mount on board the ship except for the 20 millimeter mounts and the 40 millimeter power mounts. So the 5 inch 38s, the 16 inch 50s or 45s, depending on what ship you're on, you take in all these inputs and it outputs the fire control solution. It tells the guns where to point, what the elevation they need to be at, and uh, waits for basically somebody in fire control to pull the trigger. The Ford Mark 1A actually took into account a lot of different inputs, and we won't go into all of them here. I won't bore you with them. But needless to say, the Mark 1A only had that one input added to it during the 1980s to increase its accuracy, and that was that Doppler radar to measure shell velocity after the first shot. And, I mean, it, this thing took into account Coriolis effect, so that's the spin of the Earth. It took into account, you know, barrel wear. All of those things were taken into account in the 1930s. <laughs> and it was on board an electrical mechanical computer. I mean, it's just a mar marvel, modern marvel. So once we have our fire control solution, fire, main fire control could select, if they wanted to, all the mounts that they wanted to select, and then fire them remotely. Nobody locally had to do anything aside from just load the guns. It should be noted that these systems had... Each each of the, the main battery and the secondary systems had their own fire control directors. However, each one could be controlled from another director if it was selected with the right switches thrown inside the primary fire control room. This meant that basically your 5-inch 38s and your 16-inch 45 or 16-inch 50 caliber guns, while they have different computers themselves, the two computers could be linked up to fire at the same target through one fire control director using one set of inputs. So our main primary range finder setup, our Mark 13 ranging radar, could give the range information to the 5-inch 38s, which had their own computer setup, also a Ford Mark 1A, that had its own different fire control tables for the you know shell arcs of the 5-inch 38s. But they did have their own directors as well. In fact, you can see up here, here's one director... Here's another director, here's another director, and on the other side there's one that matches this. Those were primarily used for the secondary uh, batteries, as f mostly for AA, but also for primary uh, f you know, fire control of the secondary batteries. Uh, in terms of, like, are any aircraft batteries, you know, the, the 20 millimeter gun mounts, they are all basically man-controlled. There's there you move your body around to move the mount around, kind of like you would see like a 50 cal modus 50 cal. But the 40 millimeter gun mounts were actually powered mounts, and they actually had their own fire control director for each mount. And I'll try and get in here and see if we can't spot one. Uh, we're not going to use that one. We're going to use this one. Okay, you see this mount over here? This was our director for this mount, and I'm assuming it was also the director for this front mount here. And that powered mount would basically allow, all they had to do is line up the sights on that mount. It had its own little optical sight, and this thing had its own little computer that would tell these mounts where to point. Once it had found its target, it could either be fired from that director or it could be fired locally with a guy with a foot switch. When it came to shooting at surface ships, the fire control radars were capable of observing the fall of the shot onto the target, as well as observing the shell splashes to make manual corrections to the fire control solution. So after we fired our first volley, any corrections that we would like to make, we can make through the Ford Mark 1A computer it has manual adjustments into it that you can make to get the target on, you know, to get the shells to fall onto the target more accurately. 
This nearly 100% automation of fire control on board U.S. ships during World War II was a tremendous advantage over our enemies at the time. To take into comparison, the Japanese Navy did have surface search radars and even some fire control radars at the late war. But the distrust of the technology and pride in naval traditions meant that they saw limited use. For the most part, Japanese warships operated predominantly through manual inputs into an otherwise accurate fire control computer. This meant that there was substantial risk of fatigue-related errors in the fire control setup, depending on the length of battle. And while I don't have any easily proved evidence to show that this was ever a problem, I can't help but wonder if it didn't affect some of the ways that they... Uh, you know, did things. And certainly the use of radar to spot ships during night battles towards the end of World War II definitely impacted the ability of, you know, the Japanese to accurately return fire. In fact, we saw this at Suragawa Strait with the U.S. standards that participated in that fight. West Virginia picked up the enemy battle group and was able to land accurate shots in five of its first six salvos. And on Yamashiro and that that was a huge advantage that was all at night you know that didn't happen during the day with perfect conditions Yamashiro was operating basically with optical range finders and they trusted the Japanese trusted those the US ah eh, you know we we leveraged our laziness to make things a little bit more efficient so that's fire control in a nutshell. And if you guys are interested in more information about like the Ford Mark 1A computer, the U.S. Navy actually has the old training videos for the Mark 1A online, and I'll link them down in the description. Anyway, guys, I'm your peacekeeper. I hope you guys found this interesting. I know I found it interesting. And uh, I, this this kind of stuff is just fantastic. I love it. I, I, I cannot explain how like cool and nerdy I get when it comes to this kind of stuff. I just love all these little solutions that the U.S. came up with and other nations came up with during the war to, to solve complex problems quickly. And the fire control setups, it's just cool. I just, I like it. Anyway, I'm your peacekeeper. Like, comment, subscribe, and thank you for watching.